be granted. But if one state has 41 in one year, and all you've got is, say, 300 billion for all the cities and states over two years, what do we know? We know that the government help to the cities and states won't begin to cancel out what is going to be done to the economy by the cutbacks of the city and state. When you hear people say what Obama is doing, what the Congress just did, I don't mean to pick him out, he's not the only one responsible for this, heaven knows, but what this package is that was passed is not going to be adequate, that's what people have in their mind. The amount of money given to the cities and states is not only not going to boost spending, which is the idea, it's not even going to offset the cutbacks that state and local governments are going to have to do in this society in the next year and a half. Which is why the prognosis for this stimulus is poor. It's not because they make mistakes. It's not this or that thing. It's not the Republican giving we all have to pay. That's not the issue. It's a much simpler issue. The money isn't there from the federal help to the states and cities to offset what the states and cities already see that they're going to have to do. It's important to understand that. Second, there are going to be consequences of economic downturn that put new demands on the federal, state, and local governments. This is very hard to quantify, but we know it's there. For example, unemployed people have more illnesses psychological and physical. Unemployed people and shuttered businesses and depressed communities have a whole collection of pathologies from alcoholism to petty crime. All of that stuff puts new demands on medical facilities just as they're cutting back. New demands on police and fire as they're cutting back. Each community in its own way is going to be struggling with this absurd juxtaposition of reduced resources to meet growing social demand for the services that cities and towns and the federal government as well um, provide or are supposed to provide or expected to provide. There's no, no way to know how this all plays out but it is a scary proposition because of this juxtaposition and it is going to put more strain on the economic uh, system, much more strain. And typically it takes political forms in the sense that as people get more squeezed, they look around for something to blame. Since they don't understand or pay attention to the economics all that much, it's easier to find a more ready-to-hand object of blame. Scapegoating becomes a very important thing. And uh, you are as every bit as good as I am in guessing who might be the candidate for scapegoating this time. Right? Uh, you, have, you have a number of new phenomena. We have uh, a different ethnic mix in our culture that, that, that creates possibilities. We have an absolutely new you know, thing with a, a non-white president. What kind of stuff is that going to swirl around that? And blame games can begin with all kinds of twists. We have this, this background noise of a war against terror that no one quite understands who these people are or what they are. And whoever it is that the target is supposed to be, uh, it's a mess. Uh, but. It's, it's very volatile, and that situation can spin uh, in ways that are also um, very difficult. Okay, last thing. The um, culture here in the United States is also crucial. And in the many ways, and I wish I had more time, but I don't. But one of the ways this culture works is that in our culture, when things go bad economically and politically, we have been trained as a culture to blame the political sphere. In other words, it's the president or the congress or the mayor or, or some political entity that is blamed for there being distress, being unemployment or whatever the problem is. And 
this serves nicely to keep the economic system kind of out of the story. We don't, I mean, you know, we, we, it's upsetting that the economic system isn't working, but it's to, to the president and to the mayor, to the governor, we look to, to, to do something, to fix this. To, and since the problem, I would argue to you, and I hope that what you've been reading helps to make this clear, since the argument, since the problem is in the economy, brought to us by the economy, coming out of the way our economy functions, this cultural tendency to keep demanding of the political sector that it do something about the economic sector is bizarre, but also ineffective. Peculiarly ineffective. It's as if uh, you kept having pains in a part of your body and as you got upset and hurt you went to the car mechanic and you said, you know, what do I do? And it took a while for the car mechanic to say, what are you talking to me for? I fix your car. It's not your car, it's your leg that's bothering you. So it's a little bit like that in the United States. It's not the po- Shuffling this politician and substituting that one, what? What are you doing? This isn't changing what the problem... You're not dealing with the economic system, which is what's screwed up here and not working in the way that you need as a people. And so this disconnect, we're very peculiar to American American culture. I've never seen it in in any other culture, not that I'm that familiar with other cultures, but the little bit I know about European culture, they don't work like this. All I want you to see is that the economic crisis that we're in affects the political system profoundly and in ways that are often such that the feedback makes the economic problem even worse than it would otherwise have been because of the complicated way that economics and politics are integrated in a society like the United States. And that when a crisis hits in the economic system, given the way that politics and economics work together, it's actually in many ways creating a whole nother set of problems layered on top of the economic problems. Even though the the politics tries to offset and be a compensating and an offsetting phenomena, and in some ways it is. In other ways it spins and makes it worse, and in that complexity that's where we sit, that's our problem. And that's why you'll see as much struggling with the politics as with the economics. Okay, enough of that. Let me turn now to what is section two of your reading list, which is a, an overview of the history of this particular crisis, which is what we're going to focus on. We've done all the preparatory work, the general theories and notions of crisis and how they work. Now we're going to look in detail at the one we're living through. And I would like to again direct you to that film that I told you about, which you can get here. Capitalism hits the fan. An illusion that I hope you all figured out. Um, And the reason is that that film is an attempt to give you this overview. So it'll be what I'm going to do today. And we'll do it much more elaborated today, but it gives you a a summary, in a sense, of that argument. Okay. This particular crisis, and by that I mean the one that hit in 2007-2008, and that we're now a year, a year and a half into, has both a long history and a short one. And I'm going to give you the long and the short, first the long, then the short, so you can see. And why do I do that? Because, as I've told you, when we talked about capitalist crises, they happen every three to seven years. But what we have now is not just another one of those business cycles. Because on top of the short-term business cycle, which indeed we have, we also have a long accumulated set of problems which make this particular short-term crisis very severe. That's why we need to talk a little bit about the long one. Okay. And we're talking about the United States. So we're going to take a long sweep of history. And the sweep of history runs like this. Some of you studied with me before, you will find some of this a little bit familiar. I'm going to draw a rough graph. And over here is 1820, long time ago in America. 
and over here is 1970 and I'm going to draw a line and it looks something like that and that line is the level of real wages for American workers the aver- by real wage by the way in, in economics we distinguish between money wage the money you actually get each week and what you can actually buy with that. So we adjust the money wage for the prices you actually pay so that we have a measure of what, how much stuff you can actually buy with the wages you get. The real wage is therefore the money wage adjusted for the prices. That's all. So this is a real wage measure. And for these 150 years in America, real wages went steadily up. I want to drive that home to you because that is absolutely crucial to understanding where we are now. And I, you'll, you'll see that once I go through it. First of all, look at that line. That line goes pretty much straight up. For 150 years, the average American worker took home or was able to buy with his or her wages more stuff with each passing year, more or less. That's stunning. Probably no other country in the world has ever had that. 150 years of pretty much uninterrupted. And for those of you that know, this includes the Great Depression. Why? Because in the Great Depression, the wages went down, but the prices went down more. You wouldn't mind so much if you got half your wage if the prices dropped by more than half. You'd be ahead. You could buy more stuff even though your money was down. In any case, it went up for 150 years. It made the United States a bizarre, unique place. And it's important for you to understand that because you've all been told, those of you that are Americans at least, and maybe those of you that aren't too, uh, American citizens, um, that there's something absolutely special and wonderful and unique and God loves us and more than he loves everybody else and all that. Every American politician, right, begins or ends his or her speech. This is the greatest country in the world. It's absolutely obnoxious, as Carlin used to say in one of his comedic riffs. Most obnoxious. What are you doing? I'm the greatest. You know what you do to a person in a bar who talks like that, right? Anyway, um, in, uh, in American history, there's something to this. It is a remarkable story. And it produced in the United States a sense of itself as a chosen place. A place in which something happened that didn't happen anywhere else. It had something to do with a lot of people coming here from other countries because they thought it might happen here and they were pretty sure it wasn't going to happen there and they were mostly right. This was a, 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 a belief which got deeper and more widespread because it was mostly true. That was happening. Yeah, open the windows and cool it off unless that bothers somebody. Okay. For 150 years, rising wages. And this.